Hello folks, I'm Michael Dar Game with myself Shane Stills and as always joined at the hip virtually by Michael Verney. Michael, how's things? Good Shane, oh, what's the story? Uh, it's not too much, really looking forward to the live show that we've got coming up. Uh, it's not too far away now, April 13th in the Dome in Thurless. This is presented by Sean Tracy's GA. We're going to have John Milan, Kieran Carey, Eddie Brennan and Seamus Callanan. So going to be absolutely brilliant stuff. By the way, if you're, uh, if you're a big follower of the show and you want to uh, get some extra stuff, we've got written columns, two-minute tactics, videos, analyzing how teams are playing, and a lot of audio podcasts every week. That's patreon.com forward slash our game. Michael, um, I suppose we've got Michal O'Donnell of TG Cahar coming on the show, and I see a comment coming in straight away from John Collins saying, really looking forward to the chat with Michal. What an absolute trooper, a man of the match every day. Hail, rain or snow, a great advocate of all things GA in Ireland. So we will come to that, and we want to talk about a lot of different things about TG Cahar, because the country's kind of in love with TG Cahar. And, and has been for a long, long time. But uh, first off, we're going to focus on some of the hurling we've got coming up this weekend. Leash and Carlo, certainly, you know, there'll be no love lost there. They met earlier in the league and Carlo won by five points. Leash will be looking to get one over on him here. They definitely will, yeah. And they're both going to be up in um, Division 1B next year, which is nice that they both kind of have that in the bag already. But... Like, how often do Leash or Carlo get a chance to win, like, real meaningful silverware? So they'll be going absolutely gung-ho for this. The fact that they won't be meeting later in the year in the McDonough with Carlo in Leinster and Leash in the McDonough adds a bit kind of more spice to it as well. They take a good cut off each other. There'll be absolutely zero element of, of shadow boxing whatsoever. And I said, that kind of, the carrot of, you know, winning something and having that on the board. Like, for Carlo, if they have a Division 2A title going into Leinster, that's brilliant. If, they, if they're beaten in the final and they're going into Leinster against what will be superior opposition in Leinster, of course it will be, then it's a bit of a, a downer for Leash. If they've, you know, a title going into Joe McDonough, they basically, apart from, apart from well, Offaly and Westmead are obviously going to be there, but they're going to have that nice little morale boost going into the championship that they need. Something, Shano, as well, and just a, as an aside, and we didn't talk about it, but I, the Leinster championship is giving a nice little shot in the arm with the four done live by coming back into the Antrim squad yeah. as well. Like that's a huge one. And it's a huge one for Darren Gleason. It just adds a bit kind of more spice. And you're kind of thinking maybe Antrim could potentially take a scalp now. And listen, maybe it was always the case that they were going to come back in for championship, but their ranks have been seriously bolstered going into championship. And that, that adds a, a further little layer to Leinster as well, in my view anyway. Yeah. Like Carlos form has been pretty good. I mean, I saw him in the Walsh Cup against Kilkenny. Didn't they, they obviously were very poor that night, but after that, they won their first four games in the league and you know, in relatively impressive fashion. Um, and then they came up against Kildare the last day out already, I suppose, with their fate secure. So maybe you know, they kind of you know, reined it in a small bit, but they lost thanks to a late Jack Sheridan goal 116 to 15 points, so they lost by four for a finish. So they should be, and like to be fair, like they, they had the likes of Chris Nolan and um, Marty Cavanagh playing that, that day. And those two lads have been scoring fairly heavily throughout the league. But they won't be happy with losing to Carl or to Kildare. And certainly they'll they'll need a much better performance if they're going to overcome Leash. They will, of course. And obviously, like John Nolan's going to miss the final to the best of my knowledge anyway, unless there's been an appeal that I that I don't know about. He's gonna to, gonna to miss the final, which is a big one. And that's been a team across um across other games, like Nigel Dunn sent off the last game, game when he got a red card the well. footballers. Oh, it was it earlier again, I think. It was very, very early, yeah. But, like, Nigel Dunn is going to miss the first round of the, the championship for the Offaly footballers, haven't been sent off in the last round of the league. Peter Casey, haven't heard any word on an appeal there. He's going to miss the first round against Clare. So, like, lads have to be... Lads are treading a very, very thin line. Andrew Woods is going to miss the first round, the preliminary round in Ulster for Monaghan, have been sent off last Sunday against Mayo. So, like, it used to be a case where... Am I right in saying... Yeah, I'm right in saying. I remember Brendan Bugger got sent off for Clare. Ooh, was it against Wexford in 14? I think he missed the first round of the championship in 15. Um, but it's the, the it used to be like league means you miss next round of the league or next year's league, and championship means you meet you miss next championship game. But it's kind of flipped, and both the competitions are together now. So uh, John Nolan will be missing for Carlo at the weekend, and something like that could potentially tip the scales because. I think it was one twenty-two apiece when they met in the McDonough Cup last year. There's going to be very, very little between them. Um, I expect a very, very high-scoring game. Um, 
the little edge probably just with Carlo because their form has probably been even more consistent than Leafs throughout the league and just having a home advantage is a big one and it's a good carrot and a fair carrot for the team that finishes top of the group to have home advantage in that final as well. They've earned it. Yeah, Shane Power says, do you think it's better for Carlo or Leash to win? Personally, I think Carlo, as it will most likely be relegated from Leinster, so they'd need something positive to look back on in the end of the year. He also adds, whereas Leash have a massive chance of winning the McDonough with the quality they have. I actually just, uh, I mean, that's a tough one to call. I mean, no team goes into these games not wanting to win them. So I'd say both of them would like a bit of silverware. PWL74 says, Joe Canning said he would like to play for Limerick as a second choice when he was younger. Maybe that was going to college there. Who would you like to have played for Verley? We know the dubs would be yours, Shane. Go ahead. I mean, it's obviously Kilkenny. <laughs> um, I wouldn't I wouldn't have made the Kilkenny team, so there's no point going down there. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I wouldn't have made Joe Canning's going to make the Limerick team. He'd even be making the Limerick team now. Yeah, there's no point, no point to me going out to Kilkenny and, and uh, be number 36 or anything like that. Shana, your internet is dropping in and out, so I might take over for a couple of minutes and you might come back in if that's all, if that's all, if that's all right, just to make sure it's it's a okay when Mihal jumps on. Very, very interesting question, though. Like, I would, I went to college in Limerick as well and would have a you know, you, you know, you just when you've been in a county and living there for four years or whatever it was, you do have it a bit of an allegiance to that county. Would have went and played with Limerick? Probably not. Definitely, I, w- I would have said it probably would have been Kilkenny, probably would have been the most likely one to be honest with you. I wouldn't have any interest in playing for the Dubs, Leash, Westmead, any of those, none, none whatsoever. So it probably would have been Kilkenny realistically, even though I would have been uh. Wearing the long coat most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at the players who've done the scoring for Lee so far this year. Aaron Dunphy, he's captain this year. He's 122 on the board. Peaky Maher, 23. Tom, Tomas Keyes, 3-9. Jared Quinlan, 2-12. So they've a good spread of scorers there. And like in terms of, you know, the overall top scorers in Division 2, they have a, more of a spread there than Carlo. Now the teams, they drew 122 apiece in last year's McDonough. Uh, Carlo won by five points in the league this year. I still feel like it's a toss of a coin. Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, I don't don't think you really confidently call this game. I'd probably say that they both have to be at a pitch like, and have to be at a high pitch coming into this because Leash are trying to win the McDonough and get back up and Carlo are going to be under pressure before a ball is poked even in the Leinster Championship. But I'd probably just be favouring Carlo. Probably just. Um, I think they've probably been marginally better uh, throughout the campaign but as I said if John Nolan's not available um, that's a bit of a leveller as well but probably probably it wouldn't be a bit surprised if this went to extra time either um, and it was there won't be much between them probably I'll probably go with Carlo after extra time Is Peter Casey's uh, you know currently suspended for the first round of the Monster Championship against Clare is that a bit of a leveller as well? Oh, I would have said so, yeah. I would have definitely said so, yeah. Like they're, they're going to have to go. Who is going to start? Cotton O'Neill going to start, or um, it definitely would affect. It would affect their starting fifteen, and it would affect their reserves as well. So one hundred percent, that is it. That is a little bit of a leveler against. Now saying that is is Tony Kelly only coming back and probably playing his first competitive game from injury. Is that a bit of a leveler? Maybe, maybe as well. But he's going to be on the pitch. Peter Case is not going to be on the pitch. Bar they make a successful appeal, so. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a big one. And whoever, you know, if it ends up in a draw, they're probably both in a half-decent position. But if you lose by a couple of points, you are behind the eight ball for the rest of Munster. So, yeah, I, I know that's a couple of weeks away and we're still talking about the league, but Jesus, I don't know about you, but I cannot wait for that game on April 21st. Probably a sellout in Cusick Park as well. Um, and look at the games they've thrown up for us the last couple of years. It's going to be an absolute cracker. Yeah, Shane Power, if Carroll can't beat a McDonough team, realistically, how could that give him any confidence going into Liam McCarthy playing against better opposition? It's a sticky one for them, um, in my opinion. Um, we have a question here from Alex Shooten. I, I'm going to guess it's pronounced. Do you think if Galway won Leinster, they have a chance of winning the All-Ireland? Well, it just depends on what do you use as a measuring stick for their performances up to now, especially you know under Henry Shefflin. Do you go with the 2022 All-Ireland semi-final performance against uh, Limerick when they were very, very close and coming down the stretch, they had some really good chances. I think it was Joseph Cooney and Evan Nyland had some very good scoring chances and left it behind him. Whereas last year in the All-Ireland semi-final, Galway were 
you know, they had a good maybe open in 20, 25 minutes, but they were beaten soundly from then on. So what, what would you think, Michael? If Galway won Leinster, would you give them a good chance to win the All-Ireland? Uh, you give them a better chance anyway. If they're going to be avoiding Limerick, you'd, if Limerick goes the same path they've gone for the last five years, they're going to be avoiding them potentially to an All-Ireland semi-final. They're going to they'd maybe get over that hump of a semi-final that they've struggled with just struggled with it for a while now. I haven't been to a final since eighteen, obviously. Um, you would you definitely give them a definitely give them a better chance. That's why I thought it was imperative last year that they win Leinster. And I know it was a bit of a maybe you could say a freak moment at the end that denied them. But like if they're going that quarter final route and you're facing, you know, the third in Munster and potentially Limerick in a semi final, like that is sure it's late. You know, it's a it's a, a route laden with traps like and i just i couldn't see them getting through that route the other route is far more straightforward and listen that's been a big part in in you know the reason why kilkenny have been in the fight in the finals the last couple of years as well um you're just buying yourself an extra couple of weeks against a clear team that had such a tough passage through monster and difficult monster final they ended to get themselves up for a quarter final and then to come up to dublin for a semi-final so 100 percent, i definitely give galway a better chance of winning all ireland and definitely a better chance of winning or getting to a final anyway if they go the direct route mm. and if we look at the last couple of weeks of the league kilkenny beat limerick and galway drew with limerick albeit limerick did have 14 men for a lot of the game um, we'll look at some of the other hurling finals that are coming up this weekend the division 2b final will see derry against tyrone when they met in the earlier round of the league, Derry won by 220 to 16 points. So they'll be fancy to win this one. That's Saturday evening at Owen Beg at half five. Then Division 3A will see Mayo meet Sligo. That's Mikhail Park Sunday, two o'clock. They met on March 16th, which is, you know, only just a couple of weeks ago. Mayo won by four. And Mayo's 100% record coming into now with plus 60 scoring differential. You would feel like Sligo are going to have to have the mother and father of performances to be able to keep it keep it tight in this one you'd imagine so i listen shane sligo should or uh, mayo shouldn't be in three uh, like like it's a they you know they won a right and saying keith higgins went back and they won a 2b only like, three or four years ago like they were up playing 2a and now they're down in you know what is it, the fifth division of of hurling like that that's they're far above that level they're not they won't get it handy off sligo and as i said the last day like the, the five o'kelly lynch brothers they'll put up a decent tally They'll probably get something like 215, 216, maybe a little bit more. Sligo will. Um, yeah, they'll keep them very, very honest. And if Mayo, I know Mayo have been outstanding to this point, but if they're not, um, if they're not on their game, they won't get they won't get over Sligo. Um, I would you would fancy Mayo, but I wouldn't think it's a far, a, for, a foregone conclusion, anything but actually. Um, Maeve, our MEAB12, says, Happy as I am to see Johnny Glynn back in the fold. You have to ask what's happening with young lads coming through in Galway when we bring back a lad who hasn't played in five years. Peter Duggan took, he's probably taken a couple of seasons to fully get back athletically to the level he was at. I mean, obviously, 2018, he was, you know, all star. It took him definitely a while. So it could take Johnny Glynn a while. And you can say, fair enough, he played football for um, New York in the meantime, but this is different gravy. Yeah, I don't see, I don't know if Johnny Ginn will be playing wing forward for Galway like you'd normally see. I'd probably expect him to see, in, to see him in around the edge of the square just because one thing plonking a puck out down on top of a fella, uh, you know, at club level or whatever, but like, I don't know what he'd be, I, I just don't know how sharp he'll be, you know, I, and like most wing backs and half, anyone in a half back line, a decent county team, they're all kind of killers now and could put them on the back foot big time um athletically potentially i probably expect to see him in around the edge of the square as we did with duggan and duggan's only as i mentioned on monday's show duggan is probably only in a position now where he can go and play half forward because he stepped out after he stepped out after 19 so he's missing for 20 and 21 back in 22 and 23 and now he's probably at a level after with those two years under his belt where he can get up and down and cover the miles where he, but he wasn't before so i'd probably be expecting to see big johnny at the edge of the square and probably not necessarily as a starter either, but like, <laughs> you're not a bad weapon to be thrown in with 10 or 15 minutes to go, particularly if you're not playing that direct style the whole time before that. Something completely different as well, isn't it? And you have someone like Cannon sniping around him. Maybe Connor Whelan could go, might go out centre forward if that's the, the case, maybe towards the end of the game. It definitely, I can I see the point um, that's been made about younger players, but I also see the point of, like, like, I don't think Dottie Burke or any of these guys are going to care. They just want another medal. Do you know what I mean? And if Johnny Glynn can increase the chances of them getting that medal, I think, I'd say I'd say it could have been some of those elder statesmen that really pushed for him potentially to come back. 
Well, like whether he comes on for 10 minutes or whether he's in a position to play 60 minutes, you'd rather have him there as an option than not. Uh, yeah. uh, so Division 3 um, final, that's also on this weekend. Fermanagh against Warwickshire. And Fermanagh were quite impressive in their campaign. They won four games from four, whereas Warwickshire won one out of their four games. And they ended up winning the semi-final then against Longford, Kevin McKernan scoring seven points that day. So they didn't exactly shoot the lights out. But I, I was reading um, a piece, John Harrington did a piece about Fermanagh, who were managed by Joe Baldwin. And uh, he was talking about the coaches, Dahi Hand and Peter Galvin, and saying, wherever they go, there's success. And I'll just read out some of the piece, and he goes, this is on GA.ie. With Hand as manager and his good friend Galvin as one of his selectors, they guided the Sligo Hurlers to Laurie Maher Cup and Nicky Rackard Cup successes in consecutive years in 2018 and 19. So Han says, they're a great bunch of fell, uh, lads, really nice fellas. They're like sponges. The lovely thing about what we've been doing the last few years is that this is our third place and you get to really see what the culture is like in different counties. For man as a mad Rick, mix, really. Most of the lads obviously play hurling with list below, but they're all from different football clubs from all over the county, which is mental when you think about it. There's more of a cultural link to hurling in Fermanagh than I've probably seen in a lot of other projects we've been involved in before. There's a really tight community feel to it, and it's a huge part of their identity. I'm not saying it isn't for people south of the border, but I think because of where they are in terms of the jurisdiction that they're in, you can see how much more important it is to them in terms of how they define themselves. We probably take that a little bit for granted in the south. It's an eye-opener, eye and it's a great thing to be uh, to be able to see. It's brilliant in that regard. So, you know, that'll be another interesting find. That's in Brewster Park on Sunday. Well, look, delighted to say we have uh, Michal O'Donnell of TG Cahar fame. Michal, how are things with you? Great, Shane. How are you doing? Hello, Michael. How are you, Michal? How's it going? Great, thanks. We've been threatening to have you on for a while, but delighted that you're finally on the show. And we just like couldn't help but ask you about the early days of TG Carr. Like, we'll, we'll ask you a bit about the Division 1 and 2 final and some of the matches you've been covering lately. But what about the early days of TG Carr? And how did you get involved? Because, you know, it come to the whole La Liga coverage and all that kind of stuff. But had you been living in Spain and you were fluent in the language and all that kind of stuff? How did you get back involved with TG Car? Yeah, that was there was that's kind of the start of it. All right. Uh, you mentioned uh, Ole Ole. We had been doing uh, this series. I mean, just when you think of it now, it was so nuts to think that uh, Spanish football, you could see it on TG Car or Tina G as it was at the time. And I had lived in Spain for a few years and um, look at it just so happened. Oh, yeah, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, it, look, an opportunity came up and, and Nemeton got the contract to do um, to do a number of years uh, of, of Spanish football, which meant that we had the really tough job of heading over to Spain every odd weekend to go and cover matches in Barcelona and Real Madrid and elsewhere. The rest of the programs we would have done from studio so we had an hour it was absolutely crazy like we had the technology was so basic by comparison to what it is now where you can literally just you know watch something immediately from wherever you want to we we had these uh, unusual things called tapes which uh, you know everybody had to use so you literally had to go and get a tape from madrid or barcelona every weekend and then you'd get them into editing in waterford and it was literally like you'd see in some of these news uh, documentary type things where you were up against the clock to get this thing done. Eventually, the program would go out and then, uh, you know, it always did go out, which is the, the, the thing we're grateful for. But we, we, we actually, even recently, we were chatting about it and we were saying, God, there's a documentary there somewhere. You know, how did this program ever get made? Uh, anyway, we'll see about that. But that that led to, to GAA because... Um, Sky came in and you know basically took over the rights of the Spanish football and we had to go elsewhere and that's where county finals came in and you know I remember at the time people saying to TG Cahar what are you doing you're mad like who's going to watch these things and sure of course the, the county finals became club championship became Allianz Leagues and Fitzgibbon and Sigerson and ladies football all the rest of it and sure it's been it's been greatly successful really. And if you rewind a little bit, how did you end up in Spain in the first place? And were you a journalist out there? Or wh when did no. journalism start for you? Yeah, I was a teacher. I was teaching English. I had uh, taught in, I, I was in St. Pat's here in Ireland. I was trained as a primary teacher. And then went to Spain just for some time out. Just I'd done a couple of years here. I wanted to go doing a bit of traveling. Um, ended up going to Spain, which was a very different country back then. So we're talking about the 90s, mid 90s. 
where you couldn't get by with English, like me and my innocence thinking, Asher, yeah, everybody will know what I'm talking about. I hadn't done Spanish in school, so it was a it was a real upward curve now, really, to try and learn the language. But it was brilliant. I did three years over there and uh, did a lot of traveling, went to a lot of football matches, like which was funny because a couple of years later, then you're going back to like the really big matches, um, you know, working. Uh, so, yeah, so I did three years in Spain and had an amazing time and was lucky enough to learn Spanish and came back. And that 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 was really, I suppose, one of the reasons I got that job. As a result of that, Michal, like when you were covering the games over there, did you have access to players, managers, etc.? Were you interviewing them or what was the scenario there? Yeah, and it was like so much more open, Michael, because there was much less kind of minding of players. So we used to go into the mix zone. I don't know if you're familiar in the new Camp, but there's um, when you walk down the tunnel in the new Camp to get out onto the field, you actually pass a little chapel. So there's a little chapel that players would sometimes, I don't know if it's still there, but it certainly was back in those days. And players would just go in there for a minute before they head out onto the field. So it's really unusual setup. So we would go down the same tunnel as the players, uh, obviously before they were heading out onto the field. And they would let us sit on the sideline up against the advertising hoarding, watching the match. And then when the match was, because we'd have done all our pre-records, our, our pieces to camera that we would have recorded, we'd have been in for a few hours before that. So we'd have our work done. And then the only thing that we'd have left to do is to do the interviews with the players afterwards. So the match would be over. They go back through the tunnel. We follow them. They go into the mix zone, and uh, you'd have the formal interviews first. So I remember Bobby Robson was the manager of Barcelona at the time. So he would do his interviews, and we would always be in. You know, we'd be able to obviously ask him a question in English. Um, and we, I think from memory, we were nearly the only English-speaking media there. There was a group from Wales uh, who who were also there doing a lot of stuff, but I can't remember anybody else um, in there other than Spanish journalists. And then once that formal bit was over, players would just start to appear in and uh, and others, and they would literally just be milling around. So you'd see Guardiola or Luis Enrique or somebody, and you just say, "Listen, we're over doing a piece from Spanish, from Irish TV, uh, broadcasting in Gaelic." <laughs> you to right, Matt. And uh, would you mind doing a few words? So so anyway, I, I can't remember anybody ever saying no to us. So we would do a few words with them. So it was funny because you'd be asking them the questions in Spanish because they wouldn't have English generally. They'd obviously respond. Then you'd get that back to Waterford uh, the day after when we were doing the edit and you'd have to put that subtitles. Generally, I can't remember whether, whether we put the subtitles in Irish or English, but but definitely you had the Tina G cube in the shot, which was like one thing. And then you had some famous soccer player speaking back to you in Spanish and then subtitles like people for years used to come up talking about it saying that was all a trick wasn't it that wasn't really happening at all but we, <laughs> we were saying to them no it did it happened and we got great access I remember one time actually I know you probably don't want to dwell on the soccer thing too much but we do we do yeah no panic at all <laughs> but we ended up just by pure coincidence we ended up staying in the same hotel as Barcelona when they were playing Real Madrid in Madrid we just of the thousands of hotels probably that there are and we ended up just booking the same one and we were in the same hotel we were sitting down at the table for dinner and Rivaldo was at that table and somebody else was at this table and uh and we ended up getting an interview uh with the um with the Barcelona goalkeeper who is a guy that we had met when we were over doing a series called World Cup Goal that summer with Paki Bonner you remember it yeah and um Packy was in the new camp, as I say, the previous summer. The Barcelona team were down doing pre-season training on the pitch in the new camp, and we were away up in the gods. I was kind of I was acting as a producer, and we were doing Packy's things. And anyway, next thing, the Barcelona goalie, a guy called um, Rude Hesp, he wasn't there terribly long, yeah, but anyway, I remember him. yeah, Dutch guy, yeah. And he spotted Packy way up in the gods, and and this was obviously post Packy Bonner doing like being like Ireland's greatest goalkeeper and they spotted him so Packy come down and meet the players so he went down and met the players of course he, he disappeared then because they brought him in to kind of show him around inside or whatever and then he, eventually like he came out and we finished the job but then a couple of months later and we're back in 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 Madrid this time and we're doing the the uh we're in the same hotel as Barcelona and we just ran into Hesp in the lift and we said to him, oh, by the way, we were over at the thing and Packy Bonner. And he said, oh, yeah, I remember you guys or whatever. I said, look, any chance we could do an interview? And he said, oh, God. Um, at this stage, it was Van Gaal was the, was the manager. He said, look, Van Gaal would go crazy if I do anything before the game. So 
We said, oh, that's great, whatever. And then I met him at breakfast the following morning again. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about your thing. And he said, look, I'll do an interview with you. But you need to keep this secret. Start out a room where you can kind of do the interview. And we do the interview. And that'll be grand. So the manager of the hotel gave us a lend of a room. We went and did the interview. I remember they played out a three-all draw or something that night. And it was an amazing thing. So we came back with loads of stuff. And it was like, as I say, it was... It was probably the only place you could get that kind of football at the time if you were interested in Spanish football. Eurosport did a kind of a highlights thing, but it was a very much a mishmash and there was no colour around it, whereas we were getting the interviews and the sort of feeling that you were nearly at the game. Mm. So great fun. I have to ask you about like some of the best players you would have seen when you were over there, like the original Ronaldo, the phenomenal mm. or whatever they called him. Like, I mean, yeah. he must have been amazing to us. He was amazing. And we actually saw him play his first game. So they were playing a local derby against Espanyol and they had just relayed the pitch in the new camp and it hadn't taken. So it was beautiful carpet, like when the game started and then it was whatever, 100,000, whatever the capacity was at the time, was milled in and everybody had come to see this kid that they had bought from PSV Eindhoven. I think when Robson had been there as a manager and he kind of brought him with them. And anyway, he was the talk of the town. And and as the game went on, the pitch started to cut up. Like literally there were carpet tiles of grass coming up and the players, it was impossible to play in it. But lo and behold, anyway, he'd been quiet enough during the game. And in the last few minutes, Espanyol had gone one nil up. Then Barcelona scrambled an equalizer. And then they were kind of trying to get the winner in the last few minutes. And the pitch was like a beach. Um, Rivaldo got or um, Ronaldo got the ball and he started skipping past players, hitting the ball off a sod of, of grass, taking it back, doing a one two with the grass, you know, with the sod. And anyway, what worked his way up the field and he centered it. And this guy, Pizzi, an Argentinian guy they had playing with them at the time, scored the winner. And sure, the place like went absolutely ape. And sure, that was the start of the legend of Ronaldo, really. You know, he was it was just a privilege like to have been able to be there when. When those matches were being played, uh, yeah, unforgettable. Were there like um, I saw? I think Ariel McMurk, who uh, you know, who works with Nemeton, was talking about that you would record like uh, links, you know, different part, you know, parts that sort of link different parts of the show for people who aren't familiar with the terminology. But you'd be outside the likes of the Bernabeu, which is Real Madrid Stadium, and there'd be huge crowds gathering around you. Can you talk to us about that and maybe anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, I suppose it goes to show the innocence of the time. Uh, like Ariel, and Ariel is much more than just working with Nemet. And Ariel founded Nemet and came up with the whole idea for the Spanish football program and the county finals. Um, but yeah, we used to go like nowadays, like people don't bat an eyelid. You know, you see cameras everywhere, and it's like whatever. But back then, I suppose it was still a bit unusual. So we used to record or try to record content. Uh, outside of like the Bernabeu was a really good example because there's a, there was a big open um, kind of courtyard area where everybody used to gather heading in. So you'd have like thousands of Madrid supporters would be there from early on in the day. So we'd arrive in, we'd want to do our, to record our pieces to camera maybe three hours beforehand, just to, when there was enough of people around to make it look interesting, but not too many of them that they'd start to go crazy. But we used to have these people like as we started to get towards the latter stages of recording these, we'd have people jumping into the shots or they'd hear words in Spanish. They'd be kind of hanging around and they'd say we'd mention Madrid or we'd mention whatever. And then you'd hear the big shouting and hollering going on behind. So eventually we just gave up and we said, OK, guys, gather around us there. When I say this word, you know, not that they needed a cue, but we had great fun <laughs> with them because that was the only way. And they were all like we never had any. There was no hassle or anything like that. The only hassle we'd ever have is actually from the guys who are working, the security guys, if they spotted a camera and it was in the wrong part and you weren't supposed to be recording. Like we were always trying to chance around and say, there's a great shot here now we might record a little piece here. But if the camera, if the security guys came along, they could confiscate your camera. It didn't happen to us now, but we knew of other crews that that had happened to us. So it wasn't really structured. You could kind of go anywhere, but if you met the wrong person, then they might sort of say, listen, you're not supposed to be here or potentially throw you out. And as I say, it didn't happen to us, but we were always on the warning. <laughs> and wasn't um, Wales legend John Toshek was over Real Madrid at the time as well, so fluent English speaker. I presume he would have done the odd interview with you. Yeah, actually, I'm not sure that, that he was there. I think Capello had taken over oh. uh, Yeah, from Toshek, possibly. I'm not... Capella was definitely there because I remember one the day after one of the Madrid derbies, we, we were in the airport getting the really the red eye flight back in the morning. 
and the, the airport was practically empty except Capella was there he was heading to Milan I think or somewhere and um yeah anyway even even we he kind of gave us a look when he saw a camera and all this and he said geez don't even think of coming over to talk to me now at this hour of the day so but he was definitely uh there and he was obviously an amazing manager with them um Tashak's time was probably when i lived there i'm thinking he was also manager of real sociedad mm -hmm. if you remember and uh, he was a huge character like i remember watching like i used to watch like michael robinson you remember the the uh, former irish international who was working his way up through the media and he used to actually play with the club that i in pamplona where i lived a club called asasuna the bull run in pamplona the bull run in pamplona the one and only yeah <laughs> you're surely uh, part of it at some stage or take uh, yeah I've, I've, I've children so i'm not going to talk about that <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so tashek tashek was a was an amazing character during that time when i lived there because he would come out with these like outrageous comments and I think part of it was probably because his Spanish might have been fantastic and he would say stuff and people would pick up and then say, oh, my God, this man, the passion, like he'd be running around after Real Sociedad and, you know, being a Basque team, like they really feel that that independence thing is like a huge thing and was definitely uh, back in those days because it was still like the, the Eta war and everything was still going on. So so Tashek would have been a huge figure. And uh, th that was probably the thing, like you had you had huge characters and anything went like there was no there was no managing of what somebody's going to say like somebody come out with the most outrageous comments and i remember there was a the president of atletico madrid was a guy called jesus hill who subsequently became a really notorious figure for the fact that he built a whole pile of apartment blocks on the costa without planning permission there was anyway he, there was all sorts of of allegations made against him but um but he he would come out he nearly had his own television program he'd, he'd be interviewed for so long by the journalists after games because he'd say the most incredible things about referees and about this decision going against his team at that decision and nobody ever seemed to say you're not actually supposed to be saying these things everybody just went for it and <laughs> It was it was great fun. It was exciting. It was uh, it's a very different sporting landscape nowadays, as we know. Isn't that like wonderful? Just how innocent almost the whole thing was. Like it's so kind of sanitized now. Like so raw and unfiltered and uncooked back then. It is, and I think that even I know we're going to talk GAA, but I mean I think that the GAA could probably learn a bit from that. That if you like, it still exists. I think to a certain degree in sports, like I think American football is a great example of it, where they know how to keep the media interested by saying enough without saying stuff that is litigious. But you know, like in the GAA, I think that you know people are afraid to say something because they might rise the opposition or something is they might feel that they might get misquoted by somebody or whatever. And I suppose there's, there's a journalistic responsibility there as well, but. But I just think that there's opportunities there that when matches aren't being played, that the GA should still be headline news in in the papers and on the media. And I, I know we're getting off topic, but but back then you're right, Michael. It was it was a there was a there was I suppose it was the start of this media thing. Like probably Spanish football was just on the cusp of exploding at the time. And and it still ha was was very unfiltered in terms of say people could just mm. say whatever it was that they wanted. Mm. So did you like do your recordings on Saturday and Sunday, and then you said a red eye flight, so like a late night flight to then get all the tape back to Waterford and get it cut up? Is that how it would have worked for you to get it out on Monday evening? Yeah, believe it or not, we had we had two flights, so we had we would go over. Now, as I say, sometimes three out of four weekends we we produced the thing from studio, which meant that somebody else had to go over and collect the tape. So if we were in Spain for the Saturday game, we'd collect the tape afterwards. We'd come back the Sunday morning with the match tape. So it was either me or somebody that we sent over to collect the tape. Somebody else would then have to go over to get the highlights tape. So that would be like a rough cut put together on the Sunday when all the Sunday matches were finished. And they would fly home Monday morning and come down to Waterford by around 3 o'clock, I think was our cut-off point. So by that stage... We would have arrived in on the Sunday with our main match tape and we'd have edited that down to say 20 minutes or whatever. And that would be done and dusted and all the links would have been recorded and everything would be sitting nicely and neatly on the timeline. That meant then that by the Monday afternoon when this tape arrived in via courier from Dublin, it was literally, we were waiting with the machine ready to go 
put the tape in, start cutting the stuff together. We'd even have our scripts written as to what we wanted to say. And then we'd put somebody into the voiceover booth, record the stuff, put it on tape, check everything was working, fire it out the door, and we'd have a taxi waiting outside to drive it down to Cork to stick it into the machine down there to beam it up to TG Carr. And it was awful close. Like we would be going out. We I think we used to go out at nine o'clock. And I think like fellas would be heading from Waterford at half eight for what was an hour long journey and they'd still make it on time, you know. So it was <laughs> yeah, it was before penalty points and all that. But I, yeah, anyway, we all we, that's we, a world yeah. away from broadcasting maybe four games at the one go in TG Cahar last weekend. Yeah, yeah. And now of course everything is digital and satellite technology and you can you can do, you can broadcast using 4G or 5G now, you know, with your phones, like you, you'd see stuff happening. So yeah, it's it's it couldn't be more different. But I suppose for all that, you, you learn probably, you know, it's it's problem solving the whole way along. Like we made loads of mistakes and we tried not to repeat them, and and that would have been equally the same when when you were talking about the technology. You were saying, God, this bit of tech doesn't really work, or doesn't allow you to do this so you have to move on and try and do something do it some other way and honest to god it was like we were all learning because we were all complete beginners like none of us had done anything in terms of like there for me there was never a, a course that you could do to sort of be a presenter and similarly now we did have you know professional editors and camera operators and everything else but for the rest of us who are putting together the program it was it was learning on the run Mm. And then you did a bit of Scottish Premiership, and basically Sky ended up t taking the rights to everything, didn't they, with their deeper pockets? But what was it like doing the SPL? Any highlights there? Yes, we were awful lucky. We did one season of that, and we it coincided with um, Rangers were going for a 10 in a row, which was like, you can imagine in Ireland how badly that would have gone down, because... You know, Celtic were basically doing their best to stop them. And we happened to get the rights for that one single season. And I don't think you could see it anywhere else. And it was just pure fluke. So we used to do the same thing. So as as we so that particular year we were doing like half the program of Spanish football, and then we go to a break and we'd be off to Scotland. So it was like, <laughs> you know, a bit more different. And um we go over then to Celtic Park and do matches. And we 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 actually did the last match of the season that Celtic had to win. And I remember being over there and they did win it 2-0, um, I think, against St. Johnston. And Henry Larson was playing with them. And I remember we were allowed on the pitch while they were doing their lap of honour and going around trying to stick a microphone into Henry Larson into his face to try and get a couple of sound bites with them while they were doing their little lap of honour. So, again, you, you, you wouldn't get a chance to do that anymore. You'd be just sort of told where to go, but everything was much more open and fluid and... Sure, we look if we had a great we had a great time. I subsequently actually had the had the opportunity to go back after that and to do a, a little documentary on this famous brother Walfred who who founded Celtic because uh, I'm based in Sligo now and I can, when I moved to Sligo a long time ago, but when I moved to Sligo, um, I heard about this connection between Celtic and Sligo and he was a he was a Sligo person, an emigrant back in the mid to late 1800s and went over and became a Maris brother and ended up being the guy who founded Celtic and there's a big statue to him outside of outside of Celtic Park so we were we, we got a second go at, at Celtic a few years later. Mm. Homer Hurling wants to know who's your favourite player to interview? In, in Hurling? Or... Well, I, I, well he's just yeah. called Homer Hurling but it could be in any sport. Yeah any... um god that's a good one um yeah, like I, I suppose you know what it's like. You know when you're when you're doing an interview after a game, it's literally all about the game. It's like it's rare you get into the into the teeth of um, of an interview. It's different. Like I, I worked in the early stages on on Le Creguel, um which obviously has a lot more time in terms of say you're 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 getting into stuff and deeper topics and whatever. And I remember doing a piece with Enda Colleran. The Galway great, and uh, he was captain of the three in a row team in the sixties, and and he he was amazing. Like you know to, that he he would he would speak with such calmness. You just knew that that he was a respected figure, and that he he never bigged up his own achievements. And I I always think that that's kind of the essence of of the real GAA people. You know that they 
they uh, they're humble you know so maybe it's an irish thing you know they don't brag about their own their own achievements and he was one that i remember was was great um i suppose in more modern times i've always liked interviewing kilkenny people because i think that they're straight you know they don't uh, and i know that's a, that's a generality but um yeah yeah and and club like okay so sorry i suppose i'm going back to bally hale and i'm thinking of of the likes of of TJ Reid even doing the piece of them there in, in Parky Creeve last last Saturday evening. He got a man of the match at, you know, not his first, as we were saying. Um and he's he says what what he what he's he says enough, you know, he's 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 modest, but at the same time you just knew that he was so happy that Kilkenny had beaten uh, Limerick and uh, and that he had played well and you know, I suppose he's a bit on borrowed time at this stage, and uh, to have him, he, he was very fresh. I remember there was there was a few club interviews that we did in the very early stages when, um, like, there was a great one we did with David Kennedy, who played with Tipperary, centre back, and I think he had won, hadn't he won in All Ireland in two thousand and one? Yeah, and he and he had won a Munster club then after that, and the man had tears in his face when we were doing the thing, you know, and you just knew that that kind of stuff was. Like all bets are off when it came to achieving something with the club. David Brady gave us a great interview after Ballina won the All Ireland. You know that he'd been a—he said he'd something like he'd been a loser all his life, but he wasn't a loser today. You know stuff that you know is just not prepared, and that he—he's—it's a sort of a stream of consciousness thing. So, so those they are interviews that stand out for sure. It's mm. funny you should say that, Michal. I actually watched back. I don't know how it came across it this morning. I've watched it several times. McDara did a lovely interview with Conor Feeling after Clara won the Kilkenny County final a couple of years ago. And, you know, he just, you know, as you do as a journalist, you chat about the match and whatever. And then it was, you know, the fact that he had to give up hurling. And it was just, I don't know, so there's, some, there's been some brilliant, um, there's been some brilliant interviews down through the years. I always say it to Shane as well, like in our job, you are, like it's a kind of a great position being that first 15, 20 minutes after a game is when a lot of the good stuff kind of pours because it's raw, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. After a while, they get a chance to to sort of settle down and maybe become a bit more circumspect. Yeah. Um, and you do have a lot more evidence as well now of of uh, media people coming over when you're doing interviews, as in you have people who are talking to the manager when they're coming over to take a, to have a word with you, which I think is like, I just don't understand why that's there. You know, it's not like these people are, you know, uneducated or, or whatever you know that they're going to say something wildly out of out of order but i just think that's a pity if to, if we start to manage people when they're giving their response to something and say look i i don't know what even the nature of the conversation is but i've had i've had incidents where where um i'd be interviewing a a manager now after a game and i have somebody filming me and i know it's somebody from their backroom team with their phone I'm kind of wondering are they taking that back now to look and see how he performed in his interview to make sure that he doesn't say something i'm not sure mm. but it's a pity if it's if it goes to that you know we need to be promoting the games and i think that as i said earlier you know i think there's a great opportunity for the gaa to to have a bit more um fire in in what they say to to make sure that we, all of us are talking about did you hear what was said about this particular person or match or game or whatever and uh you know, I think it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, uh, Shane Power is referencing the like some of the games that you might present to that, and he he's talking about Bally Gunner, Bally Hale. That was twenty twenty two. Harry Ruddle's late goal, and the same day wasn't it? Jerome Johnson, I think, scored the late goal for Kilku against mm -hmm. Kilmacud to win the All Ireland. And I remember kind of just standing up like that in the press box, just totally shocked by it. Are, are there games that kind of stick with you that you've you're then trying to make sense of it straight away after the game? Yeah, well, I'd say if you put those two games together, there's probably no day that comes near it. Mm. Uh, you know, we've gone through a fair few club finals where maybe the hurling was good and the hur and the football was bad, or vice versa. Or you know, I'm saying that they were they were kind of um, uneven games, let's say. And then to have that particular game where, I suppose, as a Waterford native, I was I was glad to see Ballygunner as well finally getting over uh, the finishing line and to do it the way they did. And McDar above in the commentary box, <laughs> we both know absolutely losing his losing the plot entirely. Uh, and he would have known those those Ballygunner fellas inside out. And I remember when Harry Ruddle got the ball, and I'm sure that other commentators or people would have been 
would I just had to do a quick reference? Have I got the right guy? But he didn't miss a beat and he just kept going. And then there wasn't a chance to miss a beat because literally he was driving up the field and then unleashed the shot from 20 or 25 yards out and it went in and then the game was over. And um, yeah, look at that. That brought the whole club thing together. It, like it's it's what the whole thing you dream, I suppose, of being in Crow Park. You dream of of winning in All Ireland at the puck of the ball in the last seconds of the game, and then for the thing to have been repeated in the football final, and again the first time winner in Kilku was just, that was that was amazing. Yeah. Mm. Can I just ask you, Michal, briefly about um, with Kevin Cassidy on the show a couple of months ago? I always find it one of the most fascinating interviews was when you were interviewing Jim and Kevin is standing right behind him, and you're talking about Kevin, um, about yeah. Kevin not being involved in 2012. What was that like? Because it's it's awkward, but you have to ask the question because it's the question everyone wants to hear the answer to. Yeah, yeah, we we had look that that was uh, it was just the way that the cards fell that day. You know, we were Kevin was doing analysis with us. He had been on show sport with me, I think, uh, a few nights previously, where he had said he wasn't going back, and um, like we. I suppose for me, the surprising thing was that Jim didn't know that Kevin Cassidy, who was the big topic of conversation in Donegal that day, was on our show. I suppose maybe that shows that the level of where he's at when he's doing his match preparation, that he's just locked away from any outside noise. But I mean, we were there for three hours probably beforehand, rehearsing, setting up. We would have thought that somebody would have mentioned him that Cass was on tg Cahar that day so he came over he he normally we would get the managers to do an interview with us maybe as they come in you know off the bus and whatever they get that bit out of the way in this case i remember jim didn't come over he had other stuff on so it was literally the last thing that we were going to do and i can't remember whether we did it as we were on air or just about going on air i think we did it and and we were already on air and he came over just to to say hello and and sort of give us the latest team news and then i asked him then about kevin because as you say you have to ask the question and um yeah he didn't he didn't particularly like it i think that we were there and asking him this stuff and um yeah it's one of those one of those times where you're very much out of your comfort zone but you know we would feel that it's in the nature of the you're trying to put yourself always into the into the sort of this the, on the couch of the person who's watching in at home and that we would feel we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't ask the question. So sometimes you get answers from people and maybe when they're unguarded and possibly he was unguarded that day, it made for a, a, a you know, a, sort of a um, an interview that was, that captured maybe people's imaginations for a while. Other times then people are a bit more prepared and the interview is less, um, you know that, that there's less to take from the interview it, it, it can seem a little bit more uh rehearsed or whatever but in that case yeah it was it was an interview that people talked about for a while all right and you'll you'll be seeing him again on uh this weekend when you see our map face against Donegal. like how much mm -hmm. do you look forward to these matches like and are you as obsessed with it as you might have ever been at the start i honestly can say there has not been a saturday or a sunday where i've headed out in the car and i've been saying i prefer to be doing something else even it's when the rain's coming in sideways when the rain is coming in sideways you just there's no such thing as as bad weather only bad clothing or bad equipment or whatever as the fella says um yes and we've had plenty of those over the years i mean any photo i've ever seen of myself seems to have had an umbrella in the shot somewhere <laughs> when we've been doing tg Carver matches so um it's yeah. Look at it, it's 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 an absolute pleasure heading out on a on a sun. Sure, like where where would you be at? You know, sure, you guys are doing the same thing. It's not like it costs any of us a thought to to go out and to um, you know, like the club thing is obviously like where where you get most of the drama. Like the league is a little bit kind of like you know trying to arrange the deck before you head into the championship. But um, you know, I still think that there's there's going to be really good games this weekend. I think that every every one of the four divisional finals have teams in them that will want to go for it. And I think that we could have a lot of excitement. Like sometimes you can have a little bit of like the finals can fall flat because maybe teams are out immediately. Or, and I know that's the case with Leitrim, for example, and I think Westmead. But, um, you know, I think that there's enough in it that will ensure you'll have big crowds and that there'll be plenty of excitement in the games too. Mm -hmm. and, and can you believe, can you believe me all where... TG TG Cahar has come from and where it is now, like and year. The thing I like most about it is is the 
consistent and continuous evolution. Like you're nearly the first to push the envelope where it's uh, miking up a referee or, you know, a replay been shown split screen while the play is still going on. Now I, I now that's something that's gone away a small bit recently and it, you need to get you need definitely need to get it back because it's it's brilliant because you don't miss a thing. But you continuously kind of push the envelope and continue to evolve. But can you believe where it is at the minute? Like like not been smart without without T G Carter and without yourself like people would be lost on a Saturday or Sunday most of the time now. Yeah, and I suppose look when you know we're we try to do the best that we can with what are pretty limited resources. Um so and we're in the fortunate position that we get great um freedom from TG Carr. You know, as a production company with Nemeton, um, you know, they they would be encouraged to try different things. So sometimes you know, with that ref, uh, Mike, uh, down at the at the Kerry County final, um, it was something that the GA would have prefer probably didn't happen, but but it happened. Uh, it hasn't happened subsequently, but I think that was an interesting, very interesting observation on how the referee's job is and how difficult it is. And I think that is something that should be should definitely be revisited. I mean, we've seen how successful it is in rugby, and I think that it would it would probably lead to more respect being shown by the players to the referees. Anyway, we'll see. But um, yeah, but TG Carr would, would like we're always trying to come up with little things that would be cost effective and at the same time might give a little bit more of a reveal into the games. So like last weekend, the lads were working in the office um, all week and probably for weeks in advance trying to get this set up where we would have, like we'd be able to dip in and out of matches live. Mm. Now, unfortunately, the drama wasn't there. You know, most of the decisions had been made in the previous weeks in terms of who was going to go up or down or whatever. But but it's still the technology was there. We, like we had an amazing time with it in recent years when we tried that, where literally it was coming down. If you remember, like there was, there was matches that swung on the point one way or the other, and we were getting it like really into the last minutes of the game. Uh, so that was that was really good. Even the whole thing of presenting from the sideline, I mean, you see everybody at it now, and I'm not saying we were the people who started that, but we were certainly, that's been the only way that we've done it uh, from the very beginning in the almost 30 years now that we've been doing these matches. So um, I suppose you're just trying to, you're trying to see what, what, what's the best way to spend the money that's available. And you could spend, you know, half of your budget on a studio, or you could spend that half of the budget on the match. And And we think that it's not diminishing the, the, the quality of what the person at home is getting. Like, if we can stick an extra camera angle on because we're showing a replay, well, isn't that a better thing than, than you know, having us in a nice covered stand somewhere or in a in a, in a studio space that has been put together at pretty big expense? So, and we keep trying different things. We keep, we keep pushing it as much as we can. And I suppose we're lucky in a way that we can experiment and road test it on competitions that would maybe be a little bit more flexible. So, so like, for example, like in ladies football, like there's obviously been a great relationship between ladies football and TG Carr for a long number of years. And, and they would be willing to say, how do we sit down with you and work out how to bring our games to bigger audiences? Um, and, and, and so I suppose the same thing applies then when you're trying to do it in the men's games as well, to try and just see are there ways that we can make the games more enjoyable for the people at home. I remember doing um, some live club games. Which, do you remember when Airsport had them about four or five years ago? And I remember going up to Donegal, down to Kerry, and like it, it was really good they were also trying to push the envelope and like so i remember doing a couple of like inter sideline reporter interviews we'll say with the managers and you're trying to get as close to the warm-up as possible so there's all that action going on behind you and it feels dynamic and i'm sure you're doing that stuff but was there ever times when you tried something and a bit of calamity unfolded like you know harry redknapp a ball hitting him on the head you know <laughs> Ever anything funny like that happen? <clears throat> God, you're catching me on the hop now with that. But I'm sure there's been loads of things like where things haven't worked out the way that um, that you would have you would have expected them to. Um, I mean, I can't think of an example off the top of my head. But like I'd say, people now who who in particular like broadcasting in Irish has probably been a sort of of a benefit in that you might say or you know th there could be a discussion that would go on that might just slip under the radar that you'd say geez i don't know should we have gone at that angle but that maybe not everybody would have picked up on it <laughs> um so like we would never be one for not that anybody is for censoring uh guests obviously not but you know um people are sensible enough to to i suppose say what they want to say in a way that 
that is uh, is apt for the medium, if I can put it that way. But um, like we did, we had we had examples, I suppose, of things where technology has gone down. Like in the early days, in particular, I remember doing. Um, we did a railway cup final in Markovich Park one time, and. When I think back, and I think we started with six cameras, and that wind blew in off Ben Bulban. And by the time we finished, we had one camera that was left. <laughs> and like everything, the rain had just gotten in everywhere. Now the technology is better, and the, the the equipment that's used for for kind of managing the cameras is better. So I mean, that's been our biggest enemy, really, is that we we would always try to build a gantry that's facing into the stand if we can. So you want to see people. So we don't want the people to be below us, and especially at some of the matches we'd be doing, you might have. You know that big of a crowd at it uh it happened a few years ago when we were in tyrone doing a league game and we got awful we got a hammering from people online saying you know wipe the lenses and then if they could actually see what the camera crews are doing to try and make sure that the pictures are kept clean like it's impossible to keep the lenses is that, clean. Is that the time that you changed the camera angle to the high one and sort of you know yeah. from the yeah the end of the goal then you did what the you had to do yeah, and you know what? That was a really interesting thing. We found mm. that by accident because nowadays, so Mikey O'Sullivan, who's our director, would often use that angle and would stick with it because that's what, you know, when the, when the teams come to us beforehand and they're saying, could I have a copy of the game? They want the high behind. That's mm. the one they want because they're looking at it for who's moving and, you know, tactically to, to assess it or whatever. And we cut that up live as well a lot now a lot more than we used to. And I think we just came across that by accident that day because that was the only, that was the camera. The rain was coming from behind it. So he had a clean shot and we ended up watching a lot of that game and people were saying that was an interesting angle. So, um, yeah, it's, look, uh, I suppose things get better. Technology improves. Um, you, you hope that the whole project improves as well as you're doing them. You, you know, the lads in, in back in Nemeton are always assessing every program. You know, every Tuesday they have a meeting down there and they're saying, how did this go? How did that go? And you get feedback and you're trying to deliver a little bit better of a project the next day. Mm, I know we wanted to talk about the games, but there's just, there's too many interesting yeah. questions <laughs> asking me. All. I hope you don't mind us asking you about TG Carter and your own career, but um, no, do you know, and it's, like Michael was just saying beforehand, he was able to remember the exact date that, Tina G was launched. When did you say it was, Michael? Uh, Ia de, uh, what was it? Ia Hauna, 1996. Uh, we did it. We learned it from Star Naguil, get me all. I did the Leaving Cert three times, and that was uh, it was a handy little nugget to have for a 15, 15 marker on paper two of uh, of uh, the of Irish. Um, but Shana, you won't probably want to come back in there, do you? Well, I was just going to say, is it, was it 1999 that it was changed to TG Cahar? And people like people still refer to it as Tina G, even though it was yeah. only called that for three years. I find that just remarkable. Yeah, people are. I suppose it goes to show how difficult it can be to change the branding of something. Yeah, so we get we get Tina G, we get Tina G a car, we get TG car. <laughs> so we get TG four, as, as Vernie would say now and again. Yeah, I say that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we don't mind. It's all part of the same kind of master plan to take over the airwaves, you know. So we don't care what way we are, what yeah. way we're called, as long as people are tuning in. And I suppose they are, which is the main thing. And, and can I ask you? Can I yeah. just ask you, me all about um, how satisfying is it when someone comes over? Uh, Con O'Callaghan or a Kieran Kilkenny or someone, and they're able to speak the Cúpla Fuckland, they're glad to. And also, as, a, as an aside to that, is there any element of frustration that um, you're obviously broadcasting as Gaeilge, but the vast, vast, vast majority are looking at it and they're maybe only understanding most of what you're, you're only understanding a little piece of what you're saying and they want to hear you speak in as Berlin. Like, is there any part of that frustration? I suppose that's a two pronged question. Yeah, look, to the first point, I mean, it is absolutely crucial for us that we have um, buy-in from the players and if players are willing to speak Irish and it's just brilliant for us to have players of the the stature of the players that you mentioned who went to Gael Scullina and Gael Kalashti afterwards and who you know who speak the language as naturally as any of us and if if anybody has you know we, we would always ask a player like when we're lining them up for a man the match or whatever we'd say, have you got Irish, you know, just to give them the chance. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, or sometimes they do and they're just not that comfortable doing it. So we we, we roll with that. We have done in, uh, interviews as well bilingually where somebody might just say something that they would like to say at the start and then we get into the kind of teeth of it in English. And we think that that's kind of part of the identity thing because people, like it's all culture. So our games, our language, music and everything else, 
all part of the same melting pot. So, so to have, like, if we had our choice, we would do all of our broadcasts in Irish, like every interview, everything. Mm. But, you know, people still want to hear what the county manager or whoever has to say and whether that's in English or Irish, I don't, I don't think is the key issue there. Everything else is, is done in Irish and so far as we can. Um, to the second point about, about the response, I mean, one of the really gratifying things that I have is that people come up to us at matches and say, oh, only for you doing that, my, you know, elderly relative at home who can never get out, but that this is what he does on this Sunday afternoon or she does on their Sunday afternoon. And they live for this time of the week. And it doesn't matter to them whether they have Irish or English. I mean, we do get things of people saying, I turn on local radio. We get less and less of that. Because if you remember, like back when we started broadcasting, we used to get awful. Um, there was a lot of very strong arguments of people saying, this thing shouldn't be on an Irish language station. These matches are too big. Gradually, that momentum has shifted. And now people accept that it is part of the landscape. The, the the vocabulary isn't complicated you know you're following the same kind of basic structure in terms of you know terminology that that Brian and Magdara and the other commentators would be using I think there's an acceptance there that we're now 30 years in on the thing and that if we weren't broadcasting these matches they probably wouldn't be there for people to watch uh, in large degree and and the standard is is pretty good so you know we get like I, I honestly could over the last 10 years or so I could count on the fingers of one hand the amount of people who come up complaining um a bit more maybe social media from the odd time but you, you get that uh but most people are really happy to have the matches broadcast and I think they see that the Irish language is a good fit for the matches that are mm. part of our culture you know I remember one time Conor Callan had done an interview with uh, you and we were uh taking a mick out of him afterwards because of the amount of times he said Docreche but I, 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 I want to ask you a little bit, um, in a little while, about language, because another one, one of your analysts, who was a teammate of mine as well, uh, Nisha Walter, or Nisha Volta, mm -hmm. we had this sort of talk a few times. But just a quick one. Would you have considered, and I mean, maybe this goes totally against everything you want to stand for, but having a red button option for commentary in English? Is this something that was, was ever teased out? I, I honestly can't say, but... Um... I know it's it's worked on S4C. I know that it's been something that they've looked at and they've done Welsh and, and English. Uh, I'm not sure how how that technology works um, and whether it's something that they've ever actively considered. I mean, you know, it can be done. Mm. Um, like, I, I would imagine that if uh, the TG Cahar, part of TG Cahar's because because part of its reason for being there and to begin with is to promote Irish um, that they mightn't be madly keen on that idea mm. um, because we want to promote Irish as as a, as a language that is like our normal working language like this isn't just like commentary Irish this is like all of the all of the production from when we go in from the you know early on and i you know the lads are in much earlier than i am in terms of say getting cameras and everything up and, and testing everything but the language of the day is irish like it's not like that this suddenly turns on as soon as quarter past three rolls and we're on air it's this is like the language of the day um you know and we're all trying to do that like i live in sligo which you know wouldn't have a massive strength in in irish but has a very strong whale skull I, I meet people on the street, I'd say every day, and I have a, a word or two in Irish with people, but definitely because of the whole digital age, you can you can now, there are a lot more opportunities out there to use Irish. And I suppose that's what, really what we're trying to do with the station is trying to figure out ways that people can be entertained in Irish and then they, they might get the, the gist of it and say, do you know what, I might go back to classes. And like Michael talking about his, his leave insert there, you know, that I suppose going through the school system it can be a bit unwieldy and a bit people come out with negative attitudes towards the language and maybe that they find much later on that they want to re-engage with the language and we're hoping that tg Cahar gives you a vehicle like even now tg Cahar has a has a new strand that's directly focusing on the schools on younger people so whether you're in a grail skull or in a non grail skull you you get the sense that there's there's a, an option for children when they come home to sort of feed into this thing and hopefully they'll grow up with a with a healthier attitude towards the language. 
And, and then if I'm to ask you about specifics of language. So I remember chatting to Nisha Waldron about this and I can't remember the exact way the conversation went, but he was talking in a WhatsApp group that we had that you'd kind of discussed an agreed term, for example, for a sweeper, like, is it scuba door? Is scuba door, yeah, yeah. Be used, but maybe you went with a different term or... Yeah, you know, for like crush, we call it now, yeah. And actually yeah. scuba door was, was there. And, and there was... Um, there was a facility being run by uh, DCU to come up with terms for sport and they contacted us like I'm talking about 15 20 years ago they were they were looking at this thing of broadcasting and that terms didn't exist so how would they do it so they engaged with us and I'm sure with other groups to say could we come up with a term for this and I think scuba door was probably put out as a as a word but then was considered to be too close to like a literal translation from English so Cusantor le Cush, so Cusantor Extra Defender basically translates as, is the term that we would use now. Um, yeah, so you're, like, we, we would have done, as you know, a lot of sports outside of GAA, things like boxing, where you wouldn't have had, like, for all the weight divisions, you may not have had, um, you know, a, an agreed specific term for whatever, or even the even the technical aspects of it. So, so all of those different sports sort of came in under that umbrella, the DCU group um it's probably still growing you know it's probably uh evolving as we say you know as, as the sports evolve and as the coverage evolves as well and i suppose you find words that we would find and we'd say we don't have a term for that can we rather than putting uh you know uh, an irish ending on an english word which none of us want to kind of be doing which can happen in the irish language sometimes we probably the best route is to go and find a term that everybody can go along with them because I only asked Nisha last week, I said, Air Force Real. So I've, I've obviously heard that been said hundreds, if not thousands of times over the years. And I said to him, does that directly translate to wide? And he had to go and look it up. Is it, like, are there times when you're in the same boat? You're like, I have to look that up. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know what Air Force Real means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just know it means it's the term, you know. Yeah. So it's like Air Force Real, it's, I suppose, you know. There are probably words in in every language that we don't know where the the origins of it come from um but yeah like i suppose irish like we'd always say irish is a, is a sort of a like irish is there in this country a lot longer than english and and you know it's not that long ago that we were all speaking irish or that an awful lot more people were speaking irish and then i suppose with the famine and everything else and it wiped out a lot of that population and and subsequently but if you see if you see it coming back you know you see it coming back in the cities in particular i mean that dublin team that you referenced is like an amazing example i mean there must be there must be a half a dozen members of that dublin team with irish with fluent irish you know you've got you've got kieran kilkenny you've got con o'callan jack mccaffrey an amazing irish speaker uh I'm trying to move through them now, but there were there were others who have been on that team or in and around that team, and I'm probably leaving out a couple of obvious people. But um, you know, so in the cities, it's it's growing. The the country areas, it's it's a bit more difficult because like a lot of country areas, they're losing their population to the cities, uh, and it's becoming you know less of a less of a thing that young people are returning, and you know, that's that's a different challenge, you know. But uh, but I think. You know, having having a you know a, a TV station that does its business in Irish is an important aspect of that. Just to support the language, that you can kind of you know you can act as a sort of a um, a foundation stone, along with lots of other aspects of trying to make sure that the language is is saved because it is still very it is on the precipice. Like there's no two ways around it. Like there, if if you suddenly decided tomorrow morning we're not going to fund Irish language initiatives, the, the language would be very quick disappearing. Like it's not like it's not like music or it's not, you know, that people can immediately get you. You put river dance on and then all of a sudden Irish dancing becomes a, 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 you know, a, a thing that's very popular. Like language is a difficult thing to revive. And you hear stats about languages disappearing every week. I can't remember that. I saw a stat somewhere about the amount of languages around the world that disappear and never come back. So we could be those people and then everything is English and then we're just like the crowd across the water or we can do our own thing and be proud of our, our culture and our language being part of that. Mm. How we teach it, how we teach it would, would make a big difference as well. Like a lot of the, yeah. a lot of the things I learned from Irish through school, like it's, I find it mad to say that you could do eight years of primary school and minimum of five of secondary 
and some people will go through that whole system 13 years of education and learning Irish and not be able to say you know you know Michal O'Vernig is Adam Dumb is Misha and Dennis Ogham a clown or whatever it is do you know what I mean it's mad like I I, I, know, I know of lads that had to be told how to say their name going in to do the Irish or like in their 13th year of learning Irish which is a bit kind of bizarre but that's that's probably for another day but just one question I did want to put to Michal is about the the rights and even with GA go and championship rights and things like that, you'd you'd take you know someone's arm off, I'm sure, to get championship rights at this stage. We would, we would, and we've been we've been sort of banging on that door. Um, like as it is, we're delighted because we have you know if you if you put all of the matches together, I think we're up at like even in the last. 10 weeks by the time that this weekend comes around we'll have covered 40 live games wow, in okay. the space of 10 weeks and and that's just league now we've you know Fitzgibbon Sigerson and others in the middle of all that uh ladies football um but there's always space you know we go into summertime and we're on the couch or at the matches watching and it'll be just brilliant um and in particular as you say like you have GAA go and uh, like RTR obviously you know, covering the matches BBC in the summer, but there are plenty of matches that probably there are issues around getting access to, especially mm-hmm. in the earlier stages where you could have like a huge amount of matches or when it comes to the Super 16, how do you cover all of those games? Uh, we'd love to do them. No question about it. I think we'd, we'd, we'd have the facilities and the technology and the audience and the personnel to do them. But it's a, it's a, discussion that's way beyond where I'm at in terms of the the, uh, the production that's happening between the higher end of TG Cahar and the higher end of Croke Park but it would be great, lovely to see it down the, down the line Do you know, a couple of years ago I, I took the Duolingo and I was trying to take up Irish again and I think I had you know the way it's sort of like it, it, it gives you your streak, how many days if you continue to try to learn it and do a little bit of work on it and I had it up, I think maybe 40 50 days and it fell to the wayside but during that time I was chatting to Nisha, again, who I'll bring up because he's a brilliant Irish speaker. And we were just kind of, we were on a stag over, we were in Doolin and we went over to the Iron Islands and stuff like that. And it was like lovely picturesque day, looking out over the, the water and everything. And we, he was just explaining to me about Irish. So like when you talk about something, let's say in English, you'll say, I am happy. But, you know, if I, I was to say it in Irish, you'd say happiness is upon me, the way it would directly translate mm-hmm. And he said there's a bit of a, a spirituality about the Irish language in that you never are something, just something is on you or around you. Is, is that something that you could talk about a little bit more? Or is it a topic you've ever gone into? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Look, I suppose a fundamental thing around Irish, and maybe this comes back to Michael's point about how it's taught, is that it, it can be difficult to come back to it because your brain, at, you know, when you come back to it later on, is probably working on a comparison. I say this thing in English, now I'm going to try and put those words into an Irish sequence. And that, you know, doesn't often happen in Irish where, where things follow that nice fluid um, system. So as you say, you know, things can be the, the opposite, but it comes out meaning the same thing. Um, Like I, I like personally, I think that the education system is, like is is really the key to the thing you know getting people off on the right track you see kids coming through Gwail Skull and even here in Sligo where as I say um there wouldn't be a massive follow-up after the Gwail Skull but people still have a love of of Irish my own three kids all went to the Gwail Skull then they went to English speaking schools for their secondary education and they still have a very healthy relationship with Irish because the foundation stones were put there so you put them you bring them down to ring where my you know, uh, my my relations live and, and we go down and they can immerse themselves in the thing and they have no issue with it and they don't see it as a sort of a weird kind of a thing that they have to try and get their brain to start the, the rotors turning again. But the problem is there aren't enough Gwail Skullna and there aren't enough teachers who can speak Irish comfortably. So if you are in third level now as a teacher, uh technically you're supposed to be able to teach irish but we all know loads of people who are very good teachers but a very little irish and i think that is a crucial thing and i think that they need to bring the bar up much higher that either when you're going into st pat's mary i or wherever that your level of irish is such that you're not going to get in unless you're able to converse freely in it and if and maybe if that's too high of a bar 
that they put enough emphasis on it in the four years in college that you come out with Irish and that it's not this thing where, and even when doing Hibernia, I mean, God, the amount of players that we've interviewed who are teachers and who absolutely can't do an interview in Irish is, is surprising. And these are primary school teachers that are supposed to be teaching English, uh, teaching Irish five days of the week in class. Yet, they 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 feel uncomfortable speaking it, uh, speaking it with us. So I think if the bar was raised, and then you know that if the government moved towards changing the entire primary school educational system into Irish, whatever about secondary school when you get into the kind of leave insert junior cert stuff where it might become a bit more complicated. I think that people will have a foundation then that they'd be less negative about the language when it comes to growing up and, and might be more given to the idea of immersing themselves in the language later on. And, and just on that, like we get a lot of parents who would say, I can't do, you know, like and we, I would have had like colleagues like whose kids would also have gone to Gwales School. And one of their big issues around sending kids to Gwales Schools was because they said, I won't be able to do the homework with them. Sure, I don't have any Irish. How will I do it? But they figure out a way. And they would say that the best decision they ever made was sending their kids to the Gwales School. So there's always a way. and. You know, I know that it's not a straightforward path, but I really think that unless we 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 get more Irish taught in a in an enjoyable and in a healthy way in our primary schools, really, what we do with with the TG Carr end of things is 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 one element of it. But you need to have a society that can immerse itself in our language, um, mm. and and that's a long term thing. Obviously, that will need a lot of investment too. Mm. We've we've gone a long way from telling you you're coming on to preview the Division <laughs> One or Two finals, but I hope you'll forgive us, Michal. It's just fascinating stuff, and and Good. we've really enjoyed chatting about it. Yeah, uh, sure. Might just briefly ask, how do you think the Division One Derry Derry and Dublin final will go? I'm sure you were you up at that game at Celtic Park where no. it felt like Derry didn't put out their strongest hand that day. They certainly didn't. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, um, yeah, I wasn't at that game. We were we were we were elsewhere, but. Um, it, it's look at it's the game probably everybody wanted to see and from very early on like Derry set out their stall when they went on to Tralee and beat Kerry in the first game and uh, then Tyrone like when they came to town and we were expecting fireworks and we were at that game and it was a bit of a damn squib and I suppose that's been the league you know you've had brilliant games like maybe Monaghan beating Dublin the first day out and even the Tyrone Monaghan game when it looked like both of them were kind of going down whoever lost that game uh, up in Oma on a on a like a quagmire of a pitch, and then you've had other games where, like you get like with the league, you know where where fellas are sort of standing back a little bit. Um, but it is the final that I think both teams will really go for. I think that Dublin have unearthed three or four really good players, and they'll want to road test them at that level. They're playing fantastic football. Oh my God, the last couple of weekends, uh, and Derry will fancy cut off them. Like they've a, they have a few weeks now before championship, and it'll be a really good test. They won't be playing them again until maybe Super Sixteens level, and um, and I think they'll have a right go. And Mickey Hart has always been the man for you know winning every tournament that or every competition that they're involved in. So I think that'll be and they'll be a good crowd at it. And I think the fact that our man Donegal are in the in the Division Two final, you should have like a right good you know people out in Dublin see where the teams are at, and you know okay. As regards winners, you know, small things can change that. You, you'd you'd be you'd be thinking that there'll be two very tight games. Like to me, Dublin are just they're so explosive at the moment. It's it'll be very interesting to see how Derry close that down. Like they played each other, as we know, in the league final last year as well in in, in Division Two, and Derry were ahead, and then Dublin just exploded in the second half. So so it'll be interesting to see what Mickey Hart has taken from that, and and uh, I would say he'll want to win it for sure. I'd say he'll go all out to win it. Um, and and it'll make for two really fascinating matches. And I'm delighted as well, like with the with Division Three and Four, like they're also teams that don't get much of a run out in Crow mm -hmm. Park. I'm delighted to see our neighbours from Leitrim, despite the controversial way maybe that they got to the final after that that Wexford game early on. But that said, they played amazing football. They've already beaten Leash once, and they'll fancy themselves going up and taking them on again. And uh, and then down in Westmead, uh, who, who again wouldn't have had massive success in Croke Park in in more recent times. I mean Westmead, obviously the the Talton, but you know, the, like it's great. It's it it gives people a day out. You know, it, it the summer is heading out before us now, and uh, and hopefully it'll be hopefully the weather will, will be good, and and that the the matches will live up to the standard that we want, and that we all go off heading into championship with. 
plenty of things to look forward to. Mm. Well, look, you've been very generous with your time and the comments coming in have been very complimentary. James Daly here says, TG Carr has been incredible for the GA. We'd be lost without them. Michal is a legend on GA coverage. Thanks for giving our games the platform it deserves, mm. especially the club championship. So that has been the tone of a lot of comments coming in. So Michal, thank you very much for coming on the show and no doubt we'll see you on the sideline very soon. We'll see you folks. Thanks for the time. Take care. You're a meal of Michal. Okay, brilliant to have me all on. I, there. I just it? felt Shane that, that like not being smart, like we could be here still at three o'clock chatting, couldn't we? Like there's so much, like he's he's seen so much um down through the years. Like we could have spent say talking about soccer for another hour if we wanted to all the GA, yeah, it's fascinating. And uh, uh the, the service that, that TG Carter provide to us is unbelievable. We like we'd all be lost without it realistically. Yeah, and uh, like are you looking forward to this Dublin Derry game this weekend? I, I think it'll be quite tasty. I'm looking forward to getting in there. Well, do you remember there was a nice little hype and a buzz around when they played in the, the group stages or the, the round robins, the, you know. And it felt leagues. flat. Yeah, it felt, it felt totally flat. Team. Yeah, but now you can guarantee you one thing. They'll be putting out a full team this weekend and we'll get to see Fenton against Glass. We'll get to see all the matchups that we wanted uh, that we wanted to see then. I don't, like, I think, I think Mickey Hart's used 27 players throughout this league. Would Derry have used 27 players throughout any campaign recently? I don't think so. Um, it's a couple of kind of new new players um, that, that they've brought in this year. Um, oh, I can't think of the second name. Uh, Dun- Dunica, or D- Duncia is one anyway. And, um, there's obviously Lachlan Murray as well. Um, Cormac Murphy. That- Carl Murphy as well, yeah. I think Oshie McConville said he was the best kept secret in, in Derry Club football. Like if two Sealstown lads as well coming back from that All Ireland club run the year before last, kind of making a, a, a claim. I think I think I, I think they'll be primed as well. And Dublin, as Mihal said there, are playing some of the best football they've played in the last decade. That should be a that should be a cracking final. Division two final is Looking like Paddy McBearty is going to be missing. Looking like maybe Ryan McHugh is going to be missing as well, which takes away a small bit from it. And probably the proximity to championship, um, you know, you're not going to be risking any anyone or anything like that. But it's the two best teams and two of the most high-scoring teams um, throughout all four divisions meeting in the Division 2 final. So that's a belter of a game as well. Yeah, two weeks later, Armagh are out to, against Fermanagh. That's on in, in Enniskillen. So they'll want to come through on skate. Donegal aren't out until the 20th of April. But that is against Derry. And yeah. you know what? I know it's a fair bit away, but that's going to be a cracker watching Jim McGuinness's team come up against Mickey Hart's team. That weekend, Shane, is uh, that's the weekend of the 21st. That's uh, that's Claire, that's the start of the Munster Championship. So it's Claire and uh, Claire and Nimerick, and then you're going to have Derry and Donegal. Like Mickey Hart, Jim McGuinness, John Kiley, Brian Lawn, and a million and one other subplots thrown in. It's it's going to be that's going to be a cracker. Our championship obviously starts before that, but you know, like your the juice will be flowing now that weekend, uh, big time. Yeah, and by the way, just uh, even before that, if you really want to get your juices flowing for the championship, we're going to have a preview night in the Dome in Turles presented by Sean Tracy's GA Club. Scan that QR code or you'll find it on the Sean Tracy's X account or our X account here. Look at the lineup of guests. We have Milan, Carey, uh, Eddie Brennan and Seamus Callan. That is going to be absolutely cracking stuff. So come along on the, on the evening. It promises to be brilliant. Shane, and- I, I did it up yesterday. Um, I obviously didn't, uh, I didn't accumulate our medals in it, but I just put, um, I put together, I kind of pulled together all the honours um, that, you know, we'll have on stage that night. So I'll just read it out here really, really quickly. I think it was 16 All-Stars. Where are we here? 16 All-Stars. And we can confirm that none of those were won by you or I. <laughs> 16 All-Stars, 12 Munster Senior Hurling titles, 11 All-Irelands, 11 Leinster Senior Hurling titles, all Eddies. Nine, Wouldn't mind them, though. Nine league medals, one hurler of the year, two All-Ireland club medals. And one... <laughs> 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 but uh, it's gonna be, that's going to be an absolutely belting night, yeah. Crack a night for the Sean Tracy stuff. We're going to have the, the dome will be rammed. Yeah, ah, that's going to be brilliant stuff. And the, to be fair to Leitrim, I, and I know we're jumping down to the Division 4 final here, like this this is a big occasion for them. Like the stat came out this week, it's the sixth time ever that they'll have played at Croke Park. Whereas if Dublin get to a Leinster final this year, it'll have been their seventh time in 2024 alone. So this is a really big deal against Leitrim. Oh yeah, big time. And um, 
some quite uh, evocative, uh, yeah, I don't know, provocative comments put out by by some of the Leitrim players, basically saying that their favourites going into it because they beaten Leitrim in the in the group stages of the league, which you which you love to hear, which, you, which you love to hear because um, Leitrim are overwhelming favourites coming into it because by all like as a whole they've they've been the best player throughout Division Four, but it's as I said, it's a, I remember doing a live show on Croker on the weekend that they played Derry in 2019 final and just on that isn't it mad that five years ago Derry were playing Division 4 and now they're playing Division 1 not only playing Division 1 and up in Division 1 but contesting a Division 1 final and you know being in the top three in the country just shows you how quickly kind of things can turn and um which I was chatting Brendan Rogers during the week and just said, like, did you ever think like that could happen back then? And he just said that that Rory Gallagher kind of made them believe. And he said we did in the beginning. You're kind of laughing at what he's saying, laughing when you're when he's saying, oh, some of you guys are going to win all stars and you're going to be you're going to be talking about championships and winning championships. Well, all of a sudden, it's all just kind of going together. And now there's a bullish confidence to them in a in a good way that they can beat Dublin at the weekend and that they can win in all Ireland. So that's fascinating. And from a Leitrim point of view, like, you know, Andy Moran has said it, like getting to a division three final or getting to a division four final, like that is, that's huge. I know when Offaly got to play that final again against Derry a couple of years ago, it didn't look like it was going to be played. When they got to play in Crow Park, it was a massive deal for them. And I'm sure, um, I know things are costing more now than ever before, but I'm sure Leitrim will bring a hell of a crowd to Crow Park on Saturday evening. Yeah, Tram Spieler says is Keith Byrne playing for Leitrim this year. I haven't seen him mention. No, I think he's injured. Is, is he not injured? No, no, he's not. He's not involved. Actually, no. Um, he's not involved. He said he was kind of. He had some injuries at the Gilmore's grind and that, but I think he just said he was a bit burnt out. Like, and they've gotten to the Division Four final and gotten promoted without him. I don't think Jordan Reynolds is involved either. Like that's without two of their their best players for a county that doesn't have the biggest pick ever. And like, if you look at it, you know, like. After New York beat them last year, and all like they made they you were really you were part of history, but you were not unwanted part of history. Like you are the reference point of New York's first victory ever. Do you know what happened? Like in the Talton Cup, they didn't win a game, so they lost their next three Talton Cup games. So the the four championship games they played in twenty twenty three, they all lost. And you're thinking, oh, like is Andy Moore on a slippery slope here, or Leitrim? Like what can they actually do? Can they turn it around? And I know they got uh, a dubious penalty call against Wexford in that game earlier on, but they've turned around fairly spectacularly. And now they're going into the, regardless of what happens on Saturday night, they're going into the championship with like a, a real kind of spring in their step, which is great because it was probably looking ropey last winter, but they obviously kept the, I think Andy was even saying that they all stayed doing their conditioning program and their weights and that during the club championship. And like, you know, lads can kind of, it can kind of seep in. You're like, oh, I'm not going to bother doing that. And I just go back, whatever. But they've obviously stayed at it and they've got the rewards for it. Yeah. Well, I, I noticed here we have some comments in from David Tracy, my longtime teammate in Kula. You'd be better off. Uh, you'd be a better door than a window. And I thought this was just an old bogus account made up. But he's texting me saying, why, why aren't I replying to him? So he's, he, I'd say he's nice and, and sozzled down there in Australia at the moment. So, David. How are he's you? Get, he's getting better. He's getting nicer weather than we are here anyway. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Um, but uh, yeah, he he actually left a comment on Squelga as well because he said well spelled W or B H U E L as well. So <laughs> and he says, I'm too and this is in a text, I'm too much of a minnow to have a fake account. I don't think so, David. Any man who scored that goal in the 2013 All Ireland semi final with the boot, the big fat boot. <laughs> Fair play to you, David. <laughs> you deserve a fake account. Not much more, but a fake account. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. So you were talking about Leitrim being in the final this weekend and that Derry went from a Division 4 final in 2019 to now a Division 1 final. And that was against Leitrim. And I'm just looking at the team that they had that day. And there are some of the same players who are still there. Like, So I'll just call out the team that played that day. Uh, Thomas Mallon, Carl McCaig, Brendan Rogers, Paul McNeil, Michael McAvoy, Chrissy McCaig, Niall Keenan, Parra Cassidy and Conor McAtamney, Emmett Bradley, Enda Lynn, Conor Doherty, Shane McGuigan, Ryan Bell, Christopher Bradley. And just the subs then use. Pierce Dolan, Benny Heron, Niall Toner, Jason Rocks, and McGill, Ryan Dugan. There are plenty of players who've gone on that long journey. Yeah, big time. Um, and like, the personnel hasn't changed that much. But I think Brendan, Brendan Rogers made the point that they're re- at senior level now, they're really benefiting um, from years of work that's gone on at underage. And they've a, you know, a real strong cohort of lads between the age of 21 and 24. So like if... 
you know, Derry are looking to get to the next level and unearth more players. Like their record at under twenty level, minor level, uh, and particularly secondary school level would suggest that there's plenty coming and there's plenty to cultivate. And like it's fair to say now, Shane, oh, like they haven't played like a like a Mickey Hart team like we might have thought as well. They had like that, not that like it, they're still playing a fairly I wouldn't say swashbuckling style. They're, they're defensive minded at times, but they are good. They're good on the eye. Um, I don't I don't think he's changed too much from previous years because why would you change what's not broken really and it's just well, I think a lot of it is a matter of increasing depth within the squad um, and they've definitely done that so far yeah well, I'm really looking forward to that final at the weekend we've also then to talk about the division three final which will see down against Westmead we all know Clare were somewhat unfortunate not to be in the mix but Westmead are playing Wicklow the week after the league final do you think that'll take anything out of them going into this game uh, not really, because it's a chance to win a, you know, a national title in Crow Park. They got great joy of winning the Talton there a couple of years ago, so I don't think so. Um, you kind of just deal with that on Monday if you if you get me. But I think they'll be going fairly gung ho to try and get their hands on silverware. Um, it's just tricky then to play Wicklow the following week. If they win that, I think they play Kildare the following week after that. So it'll be five weeks in a row. So there is a bit of a balance in act there. It's um, it's not simple. I see somebody commenting on my jersey there, River Power. This is the Dylan Quirk Foundation jersey. Um, you can get it on the on the Dylan Quirk Foundation dot com. Actually, um, I would never sport anything normally that is of the Tipperary variety, but I glad I gladly sport this. Yeah, it looks well on you too. Now. Yeah. Finally, before we finish up, we we pretty much have everything covered at this stage. But you want to do a stinker of a game with me? I, I'm not really mad on this idea. I think you're going to put me in an awkward spot. But go on. I hadn't actually. I I hadn't thought of putting you in as awkward a spot until you suggested it to me. But I saw an idea. Well, there. no more so that I thought there'd be badness. Which you, you suge he'd suggested a game, which you'll explain in a second. But I assumed there'd be badness to go with it. Ah, we just I wanted to make you squirm. That was all. I saw a video going around there of Thierry Henry kind of quizzing uh, Jamie Carrer, and it's basically called um, Winner Stays On. So they did it with managers. So basically, Jamie Carrer was saying, was put with Rafa Benitez, and then it was, we'll just say, Roy Evans or Gerard Houllier. And you had to pick between them, basically. It was like a winner stays on, like a game of pool. You keep winning, the same person keeps going. But basically, pick two people at the start, and then whoever wins, you pit them against somebody else. So for you, Shano, just because, obviously... I know you're exiled in Dublin, but you're you're tipped to the core. So this is just Tipperary hurlers, and this is who is who do you prefer of these? And we'll go the whole way through. There's only there's only eight or nine involved the whole way. Okay. So we'll, we'll we'll start off, okay? Okay. So it starts off with Brendan Cummins or Brendan Maher. Ah, uh, Brendan Maher. Brendan Maher or Paddy Stapleton. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan Maher. <laughs> Brendan Maher or Paddy Maher? Oh, this is rotten. Jeez. Uh, hey, gonna... it's only going to get more rotten. <laughs> um, let me see. Look, I'm not going to make myself unpopular when I go down home. I'm going to stick with Brendan Maher. <laughs> yeah, okay. Brendan Maher. Or... as well, so I don't want to ruin his week. Yes, Hugo. I saw that. Congratulations to him. Uh, he's yeah, obviously congrats. involved awfully now, so... Maybe, maybe that, maybe that, that young fella might end up playing with awfully. But um, Brendan Maher or Lara Corbett? I'd say just because of the most the the excitement of some of the moments, you'd probably have to go with Lara on this one. Whoa, okay. okay. I mean, like for me, like think think of the, some of the goals, the explosive nature of some of the goals. I think that's fair enough. Okay. I don't think that's controversial. Lara Corbett or Nicky English? Um, oh, God, that's a tough one. Because a lot of people in, you know, my age group growing up would have fallen in love with Hurling because of likes of Nicky. Um, yeah, he, he's just kind of iconic. It has to be Nicky. Okay, Nicky English or Owen Kelly? Owen Kelly. Again, it's just like through that really barren spell where Tip were not great. He just like threw the county up on his shoulders and just scored the most amazing scores. You think of the one where he touched down to himself a puck out and straight over the bar. And yeah, I know it'd have to be on. Like some of the goals he scored. Like remember 2008 against Cork? He took Class. the net off the Riggins almost. Yeah, I know it'd have to be Kelly. I've saved the best to last. Owen Kelly or Shamie Callanan? 
Um, I'd say it'd still be Kelly, yeah. Okay. No, no. You've, ab you've abandoned ship with Jamie, who's going to be ah, in the goal with us go away with that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, like both have scored them, and obviously Callan has the 40, league, um, 40 goals for Tipperary, and I think Kelly's is 27, something like that. I'm not entirely sure what it is in championship, but it'd be more in that range. But I don't know, just some of the things that Kelly did were just so exciting. Like, Callan, don't get me wrong, it's not, it's, there's not much in the difference, but I'd say, like, they don't call him the son of God for nothing. No, do you know what with Owen Kelly as well? I, I would have, of all, as good as all those players are, Kelly would have been the one I would have stu I would have stumped with as well myself. And he's that good that, you know, he's finished a decade and like he will he'll never be forgotten. Like the, the, when you do some of those things, particularly some of the risky things he's done, you'll just never be forgotten. But listen, you can gladly make me squirm an awfully legend someday. No problem whatsoever. But I think it's a nice little uh, it's a nice little thing we'll throw in from time to time. It's dirty. It's dirty. I, I, uh, I've no time for you at all now after this rock. <laughs> but anyway, look, that's more or less it from the show this week. Reminder again, we're going to have that live show on the Dome and Turles. Scan that QR code. We'll be sharing the link to it again on our X page. And so too with Sean Tracy, who are presenting it. If you want to get the audio pod, it's at patreon.com forward slash our game. Lots of written columns there. Also some audio podcasts of all the shows and two minute tactics videos breaking down. Like for example, last weekend, why I'm quite concerned about the Tipperary puck out, defending the puck out, I should say, and why it's actually pretty easy fix. Uh, anything else before we finish up, Michael? No, all good. No, you'll probably be in Croker. I'll be there uh, Sunday anyway. Looking forward to it. And uh, I'll be obviously at the league hurling then next weekend after. So all good. Yeah, full bore towards the championship now. And the clocks are changing at the weekend as well, which is great. Yeah, training will be more enjoyable with the clubs. Okay, Michael, chat to you. Cheers, Shannon.